So we're at DTW Ignite 2024. We're in the sunny capital of Copenhagen in Denmark. I'm here with Vivek Chadha, who is global head of Telco Cloud at Rakuten Symphony. Vivek, good to see you again. Good Thanks to see you, Ray. Joining us. Thank you for having me. So the trend of um, telco to techco is pretty well established uh, in the industry. We know the why behind that transformation, but what about the how? So if I take a step back and look at what happened with uh, the evolution of the mobile network technology, let's say five or six years ago, when the whole concept of ORAN started becoming a thing to contend with, uh, and the discussion is less about where ORAN is today, but what it triggered off in terms of the thinking at the board level. And what it did was it drove focus that for telcos to start becoming the digital equivalent of techcos as communication service providers, they would have to disaggregate at different levels and layers of their stack. And the reason for that was to create a much greater degree of decoupling between integrated vertical stacks, allowing them not just economies of scale in terms of procurement, but agility to start doing things and innovation and change uh, at a much faster pace without having to do the whole lot at one go. And as an example, uh, if you look at what's happened in the last two years and is now accelerating quite a bit, uh, cloud transformation, on-prem cloud transformation for telcos, especially in the core, is becoming a primary driver where a lot of mobile operators are saying, regardless of their preference of which flavor of RAN O or otherwise they will go to, especially with the 5G SA change happening, it's a perfect intersection for them to say, this is one of the key things that I need to do in my network to set the stage for me to become more agile and nimble in order to do the other levels of disaggregation on top of the infrastructure platform. So that's an example of how, which is visible today, is underway and is only going to accelerate in the next two years. And that in turn will then get followed by other components of the network, whether they be the far edge, they be the RAN, et cetera. Now, of course, you know, this isn't just a technology exercise for the sake of it. This is all about helping to make the business stronger. Um, what are the long-term revenue opportunities uh, and business models that's enabled by bringing together cloud native architectures and AI, because that's a lot of what people at this event are talking about as well. So I'm probably gonna be a little bit provocative on this. Long-term revenue opportunities for telco. I think there is a fair amount of discovery that needs to be done. I know there's uh, quite a bit uh, that is said in the media and the industry about various use cases and monetization will happen, et cetera. Uh, I think telcos are really good at what they do. They understand their business a lot better than most people assume they do. They understand the constraints, the, 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 the physics, the economics of it. But what I think this will allow them to do, and this is just one of the levers in the long-term way, is truly understand what an elastic and a programmable network can allow them to do in terms of collaboration. I've said this in the past, all value in society is created at the interfaces. Right now, most networks are closed, or if they're open, they're, clo they're open almost at a bilateral level with exchanging with a few select partners. Uh, the advantage that some of the FAN companies or the OTTs or the hyperscalers have had is they've always built inherently web-scale programmatic, programmable infrastructure, which means it was easy enough for a billion dollar corporation to integrate with them, but also a small startup in, let's say, Hong Kong or India uh, or Guatemala to say, I have something cool and I can use some of your services, but add on to that to create value. I think slowly and steadily, most operators are going to drift to that outcome. They'll all do it slightly differently. They each bring a very different flavor to their core markets, but the long-term revenue opportunities will inherently get enabled by an elastic programmable network, which then allows a much higher degree of interaction and integration with third parties than is possible today. And that's where additional value is gonna come. So in, in what way can they capitalize on this sort of new cloud native approach and you know, couple those new processes and ways of thinking in with you know, what AI, Edge, uh, IoT, 5G, SA 
can deliver and, and, and what can that do for their businesses in the next decade? You sure you haven't forgotten an acronym in that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a mouthful. Um, okay, but I do get the gist of the question. So I think um, if you look at Cloud Native, I think which was the first one that you referred to, it's not just a collection of tools and technologies. Uh, it's also a paradigm. It's how you think about doing things in a much more industrialized but agile manner, uh, which has always been difficult in the past for telcos. So what that drives is a very different way of thinking. So it's an operating mindset, it's also skills, but it's also processes. And I think uh, the combination of some of these process cultural changes along with skill set, but also getting augmented with things like AI, and you know I've, I've said this recently as well, AI to me is two things. It's first augmented intelligence, which means you start doing what you're used to doing in a much more automated fashion, and you create headroom in the business by saving on OPEX, and then you lead to autonomous behavior where you do new things, which today either are not visible to you as a business or are very difficult to achieve. But AI is now breaking down those barriers and saying there's a lot more innovation you can do either at the edge or in driving revenue streams or product innovation, et cetera. So a combination of culture change, processes and behavior, which allows the organization to be a little bit more dynamic and flexible in how they respond to the market, enabled by cutting edge technologies such as AI and edge, I think they are going to intersect to create new possibilities. How those possibilities mature, where they intersect with market demand, I think still needs to be seen. Now, of course, uh, another aspect um, here is, uh, is open source. Once you combine uh, open, source, or open source with AI, what does that mean for a more cloud-native telco? I think that's an interesting one. So, uh, if you if you do do a dipstick analysis at the event today, I would argue close to 98, 99% of the audience who are operators will assume, will confess to using a significant bit of open source, either through vendors or partners or directly in their environments. So open source is not something new for the telecoms community, uh, either on the vendor side or on the operator side. But I think what is different now is, um, with AI becoming mainstream and large language models, and I've recently heard about small language models or personalized language models, uh, what will be interesting to see is how much commonality is embraced by the industry, which is your upstream open source contributions, versus how much of that is considered secret sauce where a particular operator in Europe might choose to say, well, this bit is specific to what we do, and I think we're better off honing our skills on this bit while also enjoying and contributing to the larger open source community. Uh, I don't think there's a single answer that will address the variety and the topology of operators we see. The dynamics and the economic and technology pressures that exist in the Western world are slightly different from Asia Pacific, are slightly different from the Middle East. So I think they will also have a bearing on how fast, how deep, and how far some of these operators go in embracing some of these technologies. I have a feeling uh, the Middle East and Africa region is probably going to lead on some of this because they seem to be investing very heavily on some of these AI-centric technologies. Now we talked about sort of, you know, what these changes can bring in terms of business opportunities, but the other thing we need to consider, of course, is the customer. Um, you know, what can this shift towards um, cloud-native processes uh, and the associated technologies and AI do to help service providers meet customer expectations because those expectations are changing, ramping up and becoming you know, greater all the time? That's a great question. Um, let me take a step back. Before I address uh, the potential new age of enhanced changing futuristic requirements of operators, I'm going to take an example of the conversation you and I were having a few minutes before. Uh, you and a few other colleagues have had roaming glitches while in Copenhagen. An ideal use case, a very simplistic one, but this enables customer experience, perhaps not revenue directly, indirectly, yes, would have been if there is enough intelligence and power on your device to figure out you've got a roaming glitch and do something to self-heal and auto-correct from that. Uh, there's some stuff that already can be done, but it's not to the level where you would no longer have a conversation with me, hopefully next year saying, well, I didn't even know there was an issue, but I got a notification from a provider saying, there was a glitch, we fixed it, you're up and running. Now those are simple low touch things which actually do a lot to change customer satisfaction. I'm sure you'd agree with that. Absolutely. And these things have a way of having 
both positive and negative dissonance in your ecosystem. If you're having a great customer experience where things which you'd gotten used to in the past are no longer even a factor in a conversation, that is a plus for you and it's a plus for the operator. So this is an example of very simplest thing, existing, everyday problems that perhaps can do a little bit, that we could do a little bit better, both as the vendor community and as operators. From a futuristic point of view, uh, I think the ability to consume what you want, when you want, in the format that you want, uh, which plays again to the inherent strength of the operators because they are fundamentally the fabric that connects our society. Without worrying about the G, without worrying about whether it's an open brand based solution or not, because consumers don't care about any of that and neither should they. I think in a very simplistic crude manner, I think anything that elevates the ability for consumers to say, I can consume what I want, when I want, as much as I want, and have it be seamless as an experience for me. I think that is an endeavor from the consumer point of view. For B2B and enterprises, I think once we see mainstream adoption of 5G, my last reckoning is it's still in the lower two digits globally, active subscriber base. By the time it gets to 50% plus, I think uh, we probably will start seeing real world applications of on the enterprise side of actually slicing, and I know slicing can be done in 4G, but there's a, there's a few things you can do in 5G which is a little bit more secure, economical, agile from an operator's point of view. Where enterprises today, some of the large enterprises have a reasonable headcount deployed of managing their network infrastructure. They probably are not the best equipped to do that. That's a connectivity problem that they are responding to because they find it easier to do it in-house. And I think operators are best suited to deliver that because that is their core business. Yeah. And I think once we hit mainstream adoption of 5G, some of these things will start becoming commoditized and convenient enough that it will be easier for enterprises to consume them. Right now, I can't name the CTO, uh, actually the CEO of a large European operator. They said, we have private 5G currently as projects. We'd like to move it to a product phase where it's industrialized at scale. And this is one of the largest operators in Europe. Uh, so if they have this feedback from the market, uh, don't get me wrong, they're making money, they're getting more and more orders, but they're having to deal with the majority of them at a bespoke basis for a variety of technical and operational reasons. Once this gets to commodity, I think that's where you'll see unlocking of the enterprise value. And of course, the other aspect, apart from business, technology, the customers, is security, which kind of goes across everything that we all do. Uh, how can a cloud native telco ensure that they're providing you know, robust security and compliance is becoming more important in an AI world um, you know, for these customers, I, I guess particularly for, for enterprise customers and governments and those kind of organizations. Does cloud native, does, does your shift to cloud native make this uh, not easier but kind of better to manage in the medium and long term, do you think? Another great question. So I think 5G inherently is a little bit more secure than 4G was, but then coming down to, uh, to the rest of the stack, uh, if you look at something like cloud native, because it's microservices based, because it's completely decomposed, it actually allows a much more fine-grained control of what's happening in the environment. Is it out of the box? No. Uh, uh, it's a very opinionated architecture if you go to Kubernetes but there's enough literature, uh, regulatory uh, environment available, compliance benchmarks available, or with, whether it's NIST, et cetera, that you can, uh, if you're doing the right thing, and as Rocket and Symphony believe you're doing the right thing, if you comply to those, uh, you are inherently a lot more secure than you were in the previous generation. But that's just on the software stack. We cannot ignore the fact that the attack surface increases as you disaggregate. Uh, you're opening up your network, you're allowing a lot more interaction, which I think is a good thing. So those vectors need to be addressed as well. Uh, the cybersecurity com community is obviously actively interested in this because for them, that's the next yardstick to conquer. Uh, and there's already a lot of good work done by some of the biggest players in the industry. And uh, I, I make this an analogous to the central banks versus the ATM change when it happened, uh, which is a similar shift that's happening when you go to disaggregated networks. Um, ATMs are commonplace now, and they are no less secure than a bank. Uh, so the same thing is happening with edge compute and 5G and disaggregated. Is it 100% addressed? No. 
Uh, is it a problem that has significant unanswered questions? No. Uh, in fact, there's something happening in the industry that is actually going to seriously raise the bar for cyber threats. Uh, Post-quantum cryptography is becoming mainstream. Uh, there's some stuff uh, folks are involved in across the industry, including ourselves. And uh, I think within the next two years, we'll see real-world scaled implementations of this. Once that happens, I think the bar of entry, at least for some time, is going to be quite hard for m malevolent actors to try and create issues. So I think it is something to watch out for, but I also think it's been acknowledged quite early on, and enough input is being provided across the ecosystem, not just from the cybersecurity experts, that this is a manageable problem in the long term. Vivek, we covered an awful lot of ground there in a short space of time, but uh, great insights on, on how things are changing in the, in the telecom sector and for operators. So thanks very much for joining us today. Always a pleasure. Thank you.